This is One on One. There she is, back by popular demand, Dr. Christina Greer, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Fordham University. Good to see you. Great to see you. You have a book coming out. The book is called Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream. Yes. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm sitting there going, Christina is writing a book um, that's somewhat based on lots of experiences you've had, but going back to your Tufts experience. Mm -hmm. Tufts was, where, it's outside of Boston, right? In Medford, Massachusetts. Now, you were there when? In the late 90s. As a? <laughs> As an undergraduate okay. student, yeah. You became fascinated by the idea that there are, quote, black subgroups. Break it down. Okay. That's, that's the premise of the book. Right, no? yes. That is, that's the premise. Is that a good setup? Go and, and thinking about how these different subgroups can actually have substantive coalition building, right, with the diversity within this larger African-American group. Right. So the way I uh, label these groups, just to make sure there's very little confusion, is that I label them as black Americans, Afro-Caribbeans, and African-Americans. So black Americans I, are people whose descendants are sort of from U.S. slavery, you know, Jim Crow, sharecropping, and ninth generation Americans, essentially. Mm. Um, Afro-Caribbeans are people whose relatives are from the Caribbean. And African Americans, I, I actually classify as individuals who are from the continent of Africa. Uh, so what happened at Tufts that made it clear that you weren't all? <laughs> well, so we were all, uh, there are sort of two things. One was um, we, we all went to the Cape sort of before school started. And there's an activity where it stuck in my head for many, many years. And when I got to grad school, it sort of came up again because you see diversity at Columbia University, you know, taught and attended several universities. So one of the, the activities was to close your eyes and to raise your hands if your parents told you when you go to Tufts in, in Massachusetts, you know, don't get wrapped up and, you know, be careful when you hang out with the black kids, which I thought was a very odd question because this is, a, this is an a group of just black people in a room. Um, and so, of course, I opened up my eyes. I was never good at, you know, 7-Up right. or any of those games. And almost everyone had their hands raised, um, which was a little odd to me because this was the first time that I was ever at a, an institution with a critical mass of right. African Americans. Um, so that was the first activity, and we, we sort of talked about that and fleshed that out, which we'll get to in a second. And then the second activity was I was very involved with the Pan-African Alliance, which in many colleges and universities, especially predominantly white colleges and universities, it's called like the Black Student Union, or yes. the Black Student Association. Um, and so that was a very active and vibrant group, you know, sort of charity, trips and working with the Tufts Senate and, you know, trying to really have uh, substantive conversations about diversity on the campus, not just race, but also class. Um, but while I was there, two subgroup groups broke off. And so the Caribbean Club was formed and the African Student Association was formed. But those students also kept allegiance to the <laughs> Pan-African Alliance. So you have this in your head. You have it in your heart. You're thinking about it. Yes. And you go and you say, I'm going to write a book about what, the subgroups and whether you're really all black? Right, no, whether or not uh, we can pinpoint what policy issues actually help foster substantive coalition building. And so I came to this conclusion because there's a great book by Marty Gillins, who's a professor at Princeton, called Why Americans Hate Welfare. And it's a book that only looks at white attitudes toward welfare. So in graduate school, you know, I, I wrote, a, I was taking a quantitative methods course, and I replicated his data. That's the one I took twice right. at Rutgers, but I'm sorry, <laughs> go ahead. I now teach quantitative <laughs> methods, and I try and make sorry, it as interesting as possible. So I, I wanted to replicate his data, but I was very curious as to why he didn't ask any African Americans sure. in the survey, just because welfare disproportionately affects African Americans. So I replicated his data about whites, but I also added in blacks. But when you're a graduate student and you're playing around with data, the whole point is to add in new variables to sure. see, you know, gun control issues and all these other things. So I added in a parent nativity variable. Where that came from. Right, where your parents came from. That's right. So what I found was whites whose parents were not born in the United States were more likely to support welfare, and whites whose parents were born in the United States were less likely to support welfare. So basically immigrant whites supported it, native-born whites, didn't. And so when I ran the data for blacks, it was immigrant blacks did not support it, native born blacks supported it. But the bigger picture differences mm -hmm. that you found right. are? Huh. Well, on government spending issues. 
So I, I basically broke down government spending issues on sort of general issues and racialized issues. And what I found was when there were specific government spending issues on immigration specifically, or issues that dealt specifically with ethnicity, we saw some differences. But for the, the, the vast majority of the issues, we saw them break down in sort of blacks versus whites. Statistics work when you actually have interviews that can back up what you found with your numbers, right? So I can say 50% of the people in this interview are women. Well, that's one right. <laughs> out of two. So you need some more substance behind these numbers. So when I, when I looked at the numbers, I would then went and interviewed uh, specific members of Local 371, which is a social services employees union in New York City, because I wanted controls for class. I didn't want doctors and nannies and cab drivers and teachers. I find? wanted, I found that the controls for class are great, right? And education. Um, but there is a duality that exists for black ethnic groups in the United States in the sense that they, they definitely believe that there is a shared racial identity because there are many things that happen to black people who are phenotypically black once they're in the United States, right? So keep in mind, black immigrants are coming from black countries largely with black leadership. So the way they conceptualize race, I mean, there's not to say that there isn't colorism and there are ethnic groups and subgroups and religious groups, but the way the black-white divide, the sort of historical black-white divide that's in America mm. plays out very differently here. The book's out? Uh, the book should be out sometime next fall. Terrific, we're talking about uh, 2013, fall 2013. Also, we'll talk about what happened in the 2012 election. We'll try to make sense of that. Dr. Christina Greer, Assistant Professor of Political Science, Fordham University. The book is called Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream. We'll also talk more about how that view of the American Dream is evolving. Christina, always a pleasure when we have Great. you here. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Having Good me. stuff. Great. This is one on one. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back right after this. It's fun. One on one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Medical Center, Berkeley College, TD Bank, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by Verizon Communications. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.